yesterday. Uh, what's that? <laughs> no, Nordstrom. <laughs> no, we uh, man, we had a great day yesterday. So Austin took me. Well, first of all, he took me to my favorite breakfast restaurant, uh, Sweet Peas, and that was wonderful. And then he took me on this short little hike. Well, no, after that we went to Ross, didn't we? We went. <laughs> Shoot, Nordstrom, Nordstrom. So uh, we went, and he showed me this shirt, and I was like, "Oh man, that's rad!" Do they have a, you know, one? Was it? You found my size first or yours? Oh, okay, mine. And then they had a large. I was like, rock on. That's so cool. <laughs> so. I'll give you a hint. Anticipation. It's making me wait. And Heinz. 57. I know, I don't look it. I don't look it. I know. <laughs> oh, shoot. Hey, how do you like that picture? So I took that with Austin on Labor Day. He and I, he took me hiking again. My son, he's so good to me. He keeps me healthy. Took me hiking in the Sierra Buttes. And I took that picture on this lake and it was ripply. I don't know how it suddenly paused for me. It was like Jesus said, peace be still. <laughs> but it was just a wonderful trip. Uh, and I thought I would use that as the background for part two of Who Do You Say I Am? Isn't that cool? Yeah. So now you'll like the message more because it's pretty. All right. Well, um, let's do a quick review. And you're probably going to wonder why the review. Well, we saw in the beginning that the Father is God, clearly. Okay, we talk about the triune nature of God. Now, granted, the word Trinity is a, a human-made term. We know that. Um, but the reality is, is that we believe there is one God. Amen? There is one God, the Word of God teaches, as we will see, Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, Yahweh. Okay? Now, I, like, I kind of like the analogy of H2O, right? Ice, steam, liquid, it's still H2O. But it is a mystery, the what we call the Godhead. It's a mystery. Paul said that. He said, great without controversy, in fact. He says, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. And the word of God says he was preached to the nations. He was believed on in the world. And then he was justified in the spirit and received up into glory. So that's 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. So if Paul says, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifested in the flesh, I'm content with that. Now, I know that the theological world has tried to dig in. How do we understand it? What does that mean that God would dwell among his people? What does that mean that God would take upon him the form of a servant? and being made in the likeness of sinful flesh, the Bible says. What does that mean? I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know how to explain it. But I do know this, that when Thomas saw Jesus, he said unto him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, because you've seen, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. And that's every one of us. The word of God teaches without faith, it's impossible to please God. And in the culture in which we live, the idea of faith is ridiculed. It's ridiculed. With more and more people saying Jesus is a myth. We love them. Amen. We pray for them. We care for them. And we don't. Assume that we are better than they are, because we're not. We're simply forgiven, and we rejoice in that, and we want to take Christ's love to them and continue to pray for them. And it's easy, I know this, I grew up in a culture that viewed them as enemies and, you know, be mean to them and kind of take the political uh, 
uh, stance against these secularists. Well, Jesus says, man, love them, bless them. Bless them who persecute you. C.S. Lewis, he concluded that Jesus is either Lord, lunatic, or liar, one of the three, right? One of the three. John Wesley asserted that Jesus is almighty God and worthy of worship. Christopher Hitchens basically concludes Jesus is a myth. Hardened atheist, and the same with Sam Harris. And he knows what the Bible says. He knows that Jesus claimed to be almighty God. And we say, well, I chose to believe in Jesus. Well, actually, you know what Jesus said? In John 15, 16, he said to the disciples, you have not chosen me, I chose you. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? And I just hope that all of us would say, thank you, Lord. Just thank you. That's all. Don't turn it into a debate. Just say, thank you, Jesus. Why does it matter that Jesus is Lord? Why does it matter? Because Jesus said so. You know, that whole saying, if God says it, that settles it. I think that's fair enough. I, I don't want to retaliate against that famous, uh, simple cliche. God says it. That settles it. <laughs> All right. Jesus just said, and thank you for reading that, Susan QQ. So that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. And people say, well, you know, those Jews, they worship the same God that we do. Well, this is what Jesus said, not George. You know, a little bit of alliteration, George, Jesus. <laughs> but Jesus said this, anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. That's what Jesus said. And remember how a lot of people like to say, I believe in the red letters, right? Okay, well, here's your chance. The words of Jesus. Jesus said this. And so when we argue, when we get to thinking, ah, oh, that seems kind of narrow-minded of him, okay, maybe, but take it up with him. I'm just the messenger, <laughs> right? I'm just bringing his words. Anyone who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. And in fact, he got a little more severe in another place. He says, if you hate the son, you hate the father. Gosh, Jesus. Well, why does it matter? Because it affects you. So in this second and last part, Lord willing, how does it affect you? Well, Jesus is your creator. I know it's easy. Again, I say this, uh, and I sound like a broken record. I know it's easy for us to say, well, God created us, and God created the world. Well, Islam believes that. Judaism believes that. Okay, so God, God, God. Is there a distinction? Actually, yes. We don't just celebrate Christmas for no reason. We don't just celebrate Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus. That's what his name means. The word Yeshua in Hebrew is where we get the word Joshua. It means Yahweh saves. You shall call his name Yahweh saves for he shall save his people from their sins. That's what Jesus' name is. And so it does matter. Jesus created us. So it's not just a doctrine. We would not exist without Jesus. Well, Yahweh, this is pretty clear. Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. The breath of his mouth. 1 John, I'm sorry, John 1, verse 1 through 3, in the beginning was the word, it's the Greek word logos, remember? And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. 
And then in verse 14, if you go on and read down in the chapter, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten son in the bosom of the father. That's Jesus. He created us. Well, who is your God? You know, we joke around, you know, I say that to Austin all the time. Who is your daddy? And he says, me. <laughs> right? Well, who is your God? And really, according to Romans 8, who is your Abba? Right? Daddy, the Hebrew word. Who is your God? Well, I quoted it earlier. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He's our God. Isaiah 43 you are my witnesses, says Yahweh, or Yahweh, and my servant whom I've chosen that you may know and, un- and believe me and understand that I am he. Now watch, this is very, very critical. I don't know how many of you doubted it. Before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Embrace that. That's what we mean when we say he's the Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, first and the last. Before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. 1 John 5, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Before me, there was no God form. So he's either Lord, lunatic, or liar. Ah, there goes George again, taking it back to Christmas. (laughs) For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Remember Handel's Messiah? (laughs) Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Anyone ever sung that? That's Handel's Messiah. Come on, goobers. Anyway, look at this. The mighty God. That was the one the son has given. A child is born, a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. What? The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then there it is. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless I see nail prints. I want to see them scars, baby. Jesus said, Thomas, reach your finger. Behold my hands, reach your hand here and thrust it into my side where the spear was. There was obviously a gaping hole. Don't be unbelieving, but be believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, what did he say to him? My Lord and my God. And if Jesus were a solid Jew, he would have said, you've committed blasphemy, right? No. What does he say? Because you have seen me, you have believed. He doesn't rebuke him. He says, because you've seen me, you believe. Blessed are those, what? Who have not seen and have believed, what? My Lord and my God. He conquered death. Amen? This is beautiful stuff. Who is your savior? Does it matter? Does it really matter? Who's your savior? Like Jesus being Lord, Jesus being God, does it really matter? Well, let's see what the Bible says. To God, our savior. Who's our savior? God, who alone is wise. Well, if Jesus isn't God, then what, is he dumb? To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. 
Ah, look at this, Isaiah 43, verse 11. I, even I am the Lord, and besides me, what? There is no Savior. What are you all doing saying Jesus is your Savior? Titus 2, verse 13. As they were eagerly anticipating his appearing, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God, and Savior Jesus Christ. So you could either word it or phrase it two ways. You could say, looking for that glorious appearing of our great God, comma, and Savior Jesus Christ. Or you can say of our great God and Savior, comma, Jesus Christ. Either way, besides me, there is no Savior. Yahweh said that. Does everybody see that? Our great God and Savior. Besides me, there is no Savior. Jesus Christ. So yes, it matters. Because only God can save. 1 John 4, 14. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son a Savior of the world. Hallelujah. Who is your shepherd? Does it matter who your shepherd is? Ah, the Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. I shall not want. We lack nothing. The Bible says in Colossians, we are complete in him. Amen? We lack nothing. Ezekiel 34, I love this prophecy, about six or 700 years before Jesus. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a what? Shepherd seeks out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep, right? Christmas, God with us, among us. That are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. What did Jesus say? The Son of Man has come to what? Seek and save that which is lost. Yahweh says, I'm going to come one day and seek out my sheep where they were scattered, out of all the places where they've been scattered on the cloudy and dark day. That's the entire period of the Old Covenant. That was a cloudy and dark day where there was no forgiveness until Jesus would come. And Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd. Amen. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. You see, when we say Jesus is our shepherd, it's not just that, well, he's going, he's walking with us or carrying us through life's daily struggles, you know, sorrows, sicknesses and all that. No, no, no. The main purpose of him being a shepherd is what? To give his life for the sheep, right? That is a very good shepherd, amen? That's the best shepherd. That's even better than the guy who goes out there with a cane on stage and when someone's a lame preacher, yanks him, <laughs> right? Jesus even said this, which of you, if, if, if he has 99 sheep and one is missing, will not go and find that one. And Jesus goes and finds that sheep. You see, we weren't seeking him. He was seeking us. That's why Paul said there's no one who seeks after God. But a good shepherd goes and finds his sheep. Amen. All we like sheep have gone what? Astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's what a good shepherd does. Dies in place of the sheep. Goes and gets the big bad wolf, right? That big bad wolf was sin and death and separation from God. And Jesus says, I'll take that big bad wolf because I want to protect my sheep because I'm a good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Who died for you? This is pretty powerful. Acts 20, verse 28, Paul is speaking to Timothy, and he's been discipling Timothy, who's an elder of the church at Ephesus, right? 
And so he's been discipling this church and working with them for about three, three and a half years. One of the best disciplers ever. And Paul says in chapter 20, he says, I have testified among you of the grace of God. He says, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And so he says, take heed to yourselves, Timothy, and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, God, which he purchased with his own blood. Amen? But First Peter says, knowing that you were redeemed, not with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your vain manner of life handed down from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, the blood of Christ. God purchased it with his own blood. The blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. Who is your rock? <laughs> I love this. 2 Samuel 22, for who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? That's a rhetorical question, right? For, your, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock. Do you see what the psalmist is saying? He wants, and God throughout the scriptures wants us to know, I alone am God. Okay, you're not. <laughs> Right? That's a, common, that's a common thing. We're all God. Right? I'm God. I hear that so much. I'm God. We're all God. The rocks are God. The trees are God. The clocks are God. Even my laptop. Right? Save me, laptop. Forgive my sins, laptop. Die for me, 85-inch screen TV. Right? I know you guys are thinking, what? What are you talking about? It's common. It's becoming more and more common. And it's among those who say, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Well, thank God it's not about religion, amen? It's about Jesus Christ. And I'm not trying to mock them there, but for the grace of God, right? But Jesus alone is our rock. Watch what Jesus says. And I say to you, you are Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And some people think, well, he's saying Peter's the rock. No, watch what, ha watch what the Bible says. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now watch, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, one of the apostles, Paul, and they all did drink of the same spiritual drink. Watch, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Pete. No. It was Christ. Amen? Amen. It's Jesus. Well, wait, I thought the psalmist said, God alone, the Lord is my rock. He alone is my rock and my salvation and Savior, right? All right, we'll finish it up here. Who is your rock and redeemer? Why does it matter? Because only God can be our rock, only God can be our savior, only God can be our creator, right? Only God could die for our sins and only God could be our rock and redeemer. And the Greek word for redemption, redeemer, the root word is lutroou, right? It's kind of a big word, lutroou, <laughs> three syllables. And it's related to our word. It's kind of what we call a cognate. Remember that, educators? A word that sounds similar in a different language. Lutroou. A lot of scholars, etymologically speaking, believe that lucid comes from lutroou. I have redeemed you. I have loosened you. Right? I have set you free. I have come to redeem you. Right? To loosen you. To purchase you from that in which you were enslaved. The curse. He's loosened us. Praise the Lord. And I just love this. I just love this. Thus says Yahweh, here it is, the king of Israel, and his, watch, only one Yahweh, right? Only one. The king of Israel and his redeemer. Who's your redeemer? Jesus. The what? 
Yahweh of hosts. Isn't that great? Jesus, Yahweh. Boy, I can't believe how many people hate that. Among the religious, when you say Jesus is Yahweh, the Redeemer, I am the first and the last. Revelation says Jesus is talking. He says, I am the first and the last. He says, the one who is dead and now lives, right? Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me, God says. Another rhetorical question. <laughs> He's not asking us to go, mm -mm, let me think. <laughs> let them proclaim it. He's kind of being a little bit mocking here. Who's like me? Shout it out. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from old the things to come? In other words, who knows the future? We sing it, but I know who holds the future, right? Because he lives, remember that? Okay, let, let them tell, he's still saying it, let them tell what is yet to come. And then he says this, and may we all leave today with this on our hearts. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from old and declared it? So in other words, he's being a little sarcastic, a little mocking, but he says, don't be afraid. You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. In other words, what he's saying, trust me. I forgave your sin. 